I married David seven years ago, and from the start, I felt a strain with his sister, Lily. She made it abundantly clear that I was not welcome in her children's lives. When I first met her kids, I was told explicitly that I wasn't an aunt, a designation stripped from me without question. It hurt deeply. Lily even taught her children to view me as a stranger, and every family gathering served as a painful reminder of my outsider status. While David's other siblings embraced me and welcomed me into their families with open arms, it was a different story with Lily. I watched as her children bonded with their cousins, sharing laughter and joy, while I stood on the sidelines, feeling invisible and rejected. Each birthday party and holiday celebration was a stark reminder that I didn't belong in that part of the family. Over time, I stopped trying to connect with Lily's kids, believing it best not to stir up any drama or tension. In contrast, I thrived in my relationships with David's other nieces and nephews. I became the fun aunt who painted murals in their rooms and took them on little adventures to the zoo or the amusement park. I loved creating those joyful memories with them, their faces lighting up with excitement. But with Lily's children, a barrier remained, and I felt I had to respect the distance she set, even if it broke my heart. As the years rolled on, I began to notice the impact this divide had on my own children. They would see their cousins receiving special attention, gifts, and love, and I could see the jealousy and hurt creeping into their expressions. It was heartbreaking to witness my kids feeling left out and caught in the crossfire of our family dynamics, longing for the kind of connection I was unable to provide. One day, Lily confronted me in a fit of anger, furious that her children felt excluded. I stood there, stunned and bewildered. I reminded her that she had created this situation by teaching her children that I wasn't part of their family. I told her, you reap what you sow, your kids are the victims of your choices. It was an uncomfortable truth, but I felt it needed to be said. Her reaction was immediate. She labeled me a bad person, insisting that I was harming her children. The rest of the family, witnessing the exchange, rolled their eyes at her defensiveness. I felt a mix of guilt and resolve wash over me. I had honored her wishes for years, yet it didn't erase my desire for her kids to feel loved and included. This family situation had become a tangled web of emotions. I wished things could be different, that we could find common ground for the sake of the children. But I knew I couldn't change Lily's choices or the past. All I could do was focus on nurturing the relationships that were healthy and meaningful, hoping that one day, she would see the impact of her actions on her children and ours. Until then, I would remain a distant figure in her children's lives, a role I never wanted but was forced to accept. After years of feeling sidelined, the day came when Lily confronted me. It was during a family gathering, and I could sense the tension in the air as she approached me with a fierce look in her eyes. My heart raced, I knew this conversation had been brewing for a long time. Why do your kids get special treatment while mine feel left out, she accused, her voice sharp. It's not fair that they see their cousins getting all this attention and gifts while they're ignored. I was taken aback by her words. All those years of silence and distance, and here she was, placing the blame squarely on my shoulders. I had always respected her boundaries, even if it meant suppressing my own feelings of hurt and rejection. Lily, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady, your children have felt left out because you taught them that I'm not family. I've respected your wishes all this time. It's not my fault that they feel this way. She scoffed, disbelief etched across her face. So you think it's my fault that they're unhappy? You're the one who made the choice to ignore them. Her words stung, and I felt a mix of anger and sadness swell inside me. Lily, I continued, I never intended to hurt your kids. I stopped reaching out because I didn't want to create conflict or disrespect you as a parent. But the distance you've placed between us is a choice you made. I could see her jaw clench, the weight of the truth settling heavily between us. Her eyes narrowed as she countered, you're just trying to make me the villain here. My kids are the ones suffering because of your favoritism. I shook my head, trying to remain calm despite the rising tension. This isn't favoritism 
it's about respect for the boundaries you set. You've taught your kids that I'm not part of their lives, and now you're angry that they're feeling the consequences of that choice. I can't change the way they see me if you've taught them to feel that way. Lily's face flushed with anger, and for a moment, I feared she might explode. But instead, she turned away, huffing in frustration. The conversation had spiraled into a blame game, and I could sense that it wouldn't resolve anything. As I watched her storm off, I felt a heavy weight in my chest. I knew this confrontation wouldn't change the dynamics between our families, but I hoped that, in some way, it might lead to a moment of reflection for her. My heart ached for her children, who were caught in this web of adult conflict, innocent victims of the choices made by their parents. In that moment, I understood that no matter how much I wanted to bridge the gap, it would take both of us to rebuild the relationships that had been fractured over the years. I could only hope that one day, Lily would recognize the impact of her actions, and maybe, just maybe, we could find a way to heal the divide. After the confrontation, I could feel the weight of the family's eyes on me. As Lily stormed away, I overheard whispers among David's siblings, their expressions a mix of sympathy and disbelief. Most of the family had seen the dynamic between Lily and me for what it was, unreasonable and unfair. They acknowledged how her actions had isolated me and left her children feeling lost in the mix. Don't take it personally, David's brother said as he approached me. Lily's always been a bit much when it comes to her kids. You've been more than fair by giving her space. I appreciated his support, but my heart still felt heavy. I couldn't shake the guilt that gnawed at me. It wasn't just about my relationship with Lily, it was about her children, who were caught in the crossfire of our conflict. I couldn't help but wonder if I could have done something differently over the years, if I could have reached out in a way that might have changed their perception of me. As the gathering continued, I found myself retreating into my thoughts. I watched as the other cousins played together, laughing and sharing secrets. My own kids joined in, their faces bright with joy, but I felt the underlying tension. They knew about the rift, and I could see the confusion in their eyes. They loved their cousins but also felt the sting of being sidelined from a relationship that should have been simple and loving. Later, as we sat around the dinner table, the conversation turned to family plans for the holidays. David's siblings chatted about their children's activities, sharing excitement about upcoming events. I felt a pang of sadness, holidays that should be filled with warmth and connection felt tainted by the distance Lily had created. Are we going to see Lily's kids? My oldest asked innocently, eyes bright with hope. I hesitated, the weight of my response heavy. I'm not sure, honey. It depends on how things go between me and Aunt Lily. David chimed in, trying to lighten the mood. We'll make it a great holiday, regardless. There's still plenty of family to enjoy time with. But I could see the concern on his face, too. He knew how much this hurt me. As the evening wore on, I reflected on how complicated family dynamics could be. I wished Lily would understand the impact of her actions, not just on me but on her own children. The guilt began to creep in again. I didn't want to be the source of pain in anyone's life especially not the innocent kids who deserve to know their aunt and have a loving relationship with their cousins. It was a heavy burden to bear, knowing that the choices made by adults could have such lasting effects on the next generation. I resolved to focus on nurturing the bonds I had with the other children in David's family, hoping that love and kindness would eventually break through the barriers that had been constructed. But the shadow of guilt lingered, reminding me of the challenges ahead and the need for healing in our fractured family. As the dinner wound down and the laughter of children filled the air, my mind drifted to another matter weighing heavily on my heart, my teenage son, Jake. He had developed a knack for sidestepping chores, especially the dreaded task of doing the dishes. It felt like a constant battle, one that left me both exhausted and frustrated. No matter how many times I tried to talk to him about the importance of contributing to our household, it seemed to go in one ear and out the other. But mom, the dishwasher sanitizes them, he would say with that infuriating smirk, as if that was a legitimate excuse for not rinsing the dishes before tossing them in. 
I knew he was being willfully ignorant, and the cycle of excuses was wearing me down. One evening, after a long day at work, I walked into the kitchen to find a mountain of dirty dishes piled high in the sink. Jake had just finished his chore night, and I could feel my frustration bubbling over. I turned to my husband, Mark, who was equally fed up. I can't keep cleaning up after him like this, I sighed. It's time he learns that there are consequences for not doing his part. That night, as I prepared dinner, I had a light bulb moment. Instead of rescuing him from his own mess, I decided to let him experience the full impact of his choices. I instructed Mark to wash only enough dishes for us to prepare and serve dinner. I was determined to show Jake that his laziness wouldn't fly anymore. When Jake came to the table, he was greeted with an empty setting. Where's my plate, he asked, confusion written all over his face. Go pick it out from the dishwasher, I replied, trying to keep my tone neutral. I pointed toward the appliance, where a stack of dirty dishes awaited him. If you want to eat, you'll have to figure it out. His face paled as he realized what I meant. This is gross. I can't eat off these, he protested, his voice rising in indignation. Remember, the dishwasher sanitized them, I shot back, my resolve hardening. Mark backed me up, and I could see the gears turning in Jake's mind. Would he really let pride stop him from eating dinner? With a resigned huff, he trudged over to the dishwasher, reluctantly sifting through the dirty dishes. I felt a pang of guilt watching him, but I also knew that sometimes tough love was necessary. He needed to understand that there were real-world consequences for his actions, and this was a lesson I couldn't shield him from any longer. Jake eventually settled for the least disgusting plate and sat down to eat, his expression a mix of disgust and defeat. I watched him quietly, relieved but still anxious about how this experience would shape him. Would he learn from it or just resent me for forcing him to face the reality of his choices? As the days passed, I noticed a change. For the first time, Jake began to take a bit more pride in his chores. He rinsed the dishes before loading them into the washer and even started doing a better job of loading them. It was as if the realization had finally sunk in, he could either face the consequences or step up and contribute. The incident not only improved his approach to chores but also sparked some deeper conversations between us. I found myself sharing more about the importance of responsibility and teamwork in a family. He began to see that being part of a household meant more than just sharing the space, it was about contributing to its care and upkeep. While the guilt lingered about pushing him to that breaking point, I realized that sometimes, as a parent, you have to take a step back and let them face the consequences. It wasn't easy, but I hoped that this experience would instill a sense of accountability in Jake that would serve him well into adulthood. In the end, parenting is filled with tough choices, and while I didn't want to be the bad guy, I knew I had to be the one to guide him through life's lessons, even if that meant letting him eat off a dirty plate now and then. As the dinner settled into a comfortable hum of chatter and laughter, another matter weighed heavily on my mind, my younger brother, Ethan. He had recently gotten married, and now the family was entangled in a mess of financial expectations and pressures surrounding their wedding. I couldn't shake the feeling that the situation was spiraling out of control, and I was caught in the middle. It all started when my parents approached me with a seemingly casual request. Could you help out a little? We need to pay back Uncle Joe for the loan he gave us to cover the wedding expenses, my mom had said, her tone light but the undercurrent of urgency clear. They were asking me, the one with savings and a stable job, to take out a loan to cover their debt. I felt a rush of disbelief. You want me to take a loan for something that's not even my responsibility? I replied, incredulity creeping into my voice. Ethan and his wife should handle their own expenses. They're adults now. My parents exchanged worried glances. But we don't have the money, and they're young and just starting out, my dad chimed in, his voice tinged with desperation. You're the only one who can help us out. The weight of their expectations hung heavy in the air. I could see the pressure they felt, not only from the looming debt but also from the societal expectations surrounding weddings. But I was firm. 
I can't do that. If you couldn't afford the wedding in the first place, maybe it shouldn't have happened in the way it did, I said, trying to keep my tone steady. As the days passed, the calls and texts from family members flooded in, each one echoing the same plea, you're the only one who can help. I felt a mix of frustration and sadness. It wasn't that I didn't want to support my family, but I knew that stepping in like this would only perpetuate a cycle of financial irresponsibility. Do they not see how unsustainable this is? I thought. I imagined Ethan and his wife struggling with financial decisions while my parents continued to lean on me as their safety net. If I took out a loan, where would it end? Would I be expected to bail them out again in the future? Finally, I decided to have a frank discussion with Ethan. Hey, we need to talk about this wedding debt, I said when we finally had a moment alone. He looked at me, a mix of surprise and apprehension on his face. What do you mean? I love you, man, but you and your wife are adults now. It's time to start taking financial responsibility for your decisions. Relying on family to bail you out isn't the way to build a strong foundation, I explained, trying to come from a place of support. He sighed, running a hand through his hair. I know, but everything just happened so fast. The wedding costs piled up, and now we're struggling. I didn't mean to put anyone in a tough spot. I could see the guilt in his eyes, but I also sensed the reluctance to take full responsibility. You're not a kid anymore. It's okay to admit you made a mistake, but now you need to figure out how to deal with it, I said gently. Maybe start budgeting or find part-time work if you need to. Don't let this spiral out of control. Ethan nodded, absorbing my words. We talked about practical steps he could take, and by the end of our conversation, I felt a bit of relief. Maybe this was the turning point he needed to embrace his adult responsibilities. As I hung up the phone, I felt a wave of determination. I wasn't going to take out a loan or put myself in a financially vulnerable position to support someone else's choices. Boundaries were essential, especially when it came to family dynamics. I realized that while love and support are crucial, enabling poor financial habits only sets everyone up for future struggles. In the end, I hoped that my stand would not only empower Ethan but also encourage my parents to rethink how they handled family finances. It was time for everyone to step up, to learn that financial responsibility is part of growing up, and that creating healthy boundaries was essential for maintaining our relationships without the burden of resentment.